Thanks very much, Sassy. Um, let me just start my stop clock. Um, so um, I'll be talking about what does social networks have to do with changing services? Um, and good day to everybody. Thanks for joining. Um, so we've been hearing quite a lot about patient experience um, this morning or this afternoon, wherever we are. Um, and one aspect of something that influences patient experience that the patient isn't necessarily aware of is the connections between members of the healthcare workforce and um, that they're interacting with. And that can be the case even if the patient is just interacting with a single healthcare worker. That healthcare worker is connected to other members of the team. And those connections between healthcare workers um, are part of this kind of health system soft software. And this is one way of kind of thinking about the complexity of health systems um, being having components of hardware and also software. And we know that software aspects of health systems, such as ideas and interests, relationships and power and values and norms, also um, influence the quality of care being delivered by healthcare systems. So when we think about a particular specific healthcare setting, then all of those components will be at play and um, including aspects of software um, that will be influencing the quality of care being delivered. And um, that will include things like behavioural norms of staff and also where kind of power and influence lies and therefore how change might happen. We might think about maybe looking at the organogram. This isn't from a healthcare setting, as you can see, the organogram that I put here, but you know, maybe thinking about where the formal authority um, lies and um, chains of command, things like that. But then there are also these kind of more day to day informal interactions that happen um, in life, including in, in hospitals where people um, ask others for advice or support with decision making, that kind of thing. And the two might look quite different. So why are these kind of informal social, in social interactions important? Well, we know from existing sociological theory that the people that we kind of interact with on a day-to-day -day basis influence our own behaviours um, and in hospitals um, or in healthcare settings then we know that um, there are lots and lots of challenges um, and constraints associated with day-to-day -day practice so um, the way in which we kind of find our way um, and, and work out the, the behavioural norms that we that we adopt are influenced by those around us um, also uh, the people that we spend our time with and our peers influence how our behavior changes. So an example here is from Roger's diffusion of innovation model where um, people are much more likely to adopt an innovation themselves once their peers, those around them have already adopted the innovation. Also the kind of more general structures that we see kind of forming of people's ties with one another can um, disadvantage certain individuals or groups within that setting. And here's a a cartoon that's an excellent suggestion Miss Triggs perhaps one of the men here would like to make it um but a challenge with these social interactions that happen or these more, more informal ties in the workplace um one challenge is that they're very difficult to um capture measure um or communicate and um some some very important decision making conversations for example about patient care might even happen in um, hospital corridors or places that might not be quite so amenable to um, usual methodologies. So one approach or one option um, might be to use a methodology called social network analysis, um, which provides a vocabulary and set of measures, a quantitative measures for relational data. And you can see here in the um, table below that that data could come from many different sources of evidence, for example, could be observations or questionnaires, interviews or other even other um, sources. But the relational data is analysed using this network analysis approach. And essentially, um, the social network analysis uses graph theory um, and looks at nodes, which is kind of blobs. And in our case, there would be healthcare workers and edges, which is the connection between the two nodes. And that edge can either be present or absent. It could be non-directional or directional, and it could even be weighted. And here's an example from the literature, um, the uh, references below. Um, and this social network analysis study was conducted on a renal ward in Australia, where they asked healthcare workers who they went to for advice about medication. And um, the authors noted that actually there weren't that many, there wasn't that much advice seeking going on, they felt, but where there was advice seeking going on um, for medication, then it was much less likely to happen between individuals from different professional groups. 
So you can see here, this is a sociogram, which is like a, um, a visual representation of social network data. And it's a directed sociogram because you can see the arrows here, or you might be able to see them, they're quite small. <laughs> um, but you can see that nurses, which are in, who are blue on this sociogram are kind of grouped to the kind of top end of the sociogram, whereas the doctors that are in green are more towards the bottom. Um, there, is, there is a junior doctor, a senior nurse, and a pharmacist that are very central to the network overall in this example. So with, um, with my wonderful colleagues, um, as part of my PhD, um, I've been undertaking a realist synthesis, looking at the social ties of hospital staff, asking the question, how, why, for whom, to what extent and in what context do the social ties of staff within a hospital influence quality of service delivery, including quality improvement? Um, so we conducted a systematic search and um, retrieved quite a lot of citations um, from which 75 social network analysis studies were included. And these were um, set in hospitals and we're looking at networks of staff. They're mostly from high income settings. I won't go into this in detail at all, but for those not familiar with real realism, the realist approach put forward by Paulson and Tilly, then essentially um, one, one looks for patterns within data to build arguments from which to develop um, abstracted theory. And the unit of analysis in um, this realist approach is the context mechanism outcome configuration, where something about the context, some element of context, triggers a mechanism which is usually something that's kind of latent and unseen and that causes an outcome to occur so therefore it's a kind of looking for these explanatory um, pathways so that then one can ideally <laughs> one after identifying what it is about the context it gives a kind of um a target for intervention potentially whereas one, one might be able to manipulate that context in a way that an alternative mechanism might be triggered um, for a different outcome to occur and again, I won't go into this in detail, but this was um, the kind of uh, methodology we used in the analysis to um, first of all configure the CMOCs and then to develop the program theory and um, to ensure that it was supported by, um, by the data and refined. And um, the program theory uh, that resulted from this work um, consisted of four domains, organizing domains which were emergent from the data. Um, and included 35 context mechanism outcome configurations. And these domains were social groups, hierarchy, bridging distance, and discourse. And I'll just give you an example of social groups. There were 13 CMOCs in this domain. And a summary of the domain was that hospital staff prefer to communicate with colleagues who are similar to themselves and with whom they share trust. However, this can create boundaries, silos, and redundant information within pockets of the workforce and different behavioral norms adopted by members of different groups dominated by individual, by influential individuals. And just an example of a context mechanism outcome configuration from this domain. When a healthcare worker has an existing reciprocal relationship with a peer, that's the context, they will preferentially seek advice or support from that person, which is the outcome, because they trust the person, mechanism, and feel comfortable. So the conclusions that we found from this synthesis were that individual healthcare workers are subject to their pos social position in the workforce at large, determining both their access to information and support from others and the possible actions available to them. And potential targets for intervention are identified for, proving, for improving communication and distribution of influence and power, and thereby supporting behavioural change and quality improvement initiatives in hospitals. Um, so going on from, from the realist synthesis, then, um, I'm now uh, working with colleagues on the pathway study, which we're hoping will start um, early next year. And uh, it's being led by Conrad Wanyama. And again, this pathway study is looking at these um, interactions within the healthcare team. Um, and we'll be using a realist evaluation approach and um, to look at ties between staff involved in the delivery of care to newborns um, in two hospitals in Nairobi. And to collect the data um, for that realist evaluation, we'll be using non-participant observation um, in-depth interviews and social network analysis. <laughs> and then we'll use um, that diverse data to um, inform a co-design um, event with stakeholders. And the objective, I suppose, of the work will be to try to find a way of better understanding these um, relational ties and the, the um, influence they have on quality of care, and then to try to identify um, ways in which we might usefully use that understanding to improve um, quality um, through, and this is part of, a, of, I'm sure many of us are aware of the CI initiative, so this is part of a much wider programme of work um, looking to 
intervene to improve quality of newborn care in Kenya. Um, so thank you very much. Um, <laughs> uh, questions very welcome. <laughs>